I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Today we're reading the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 14. And between chapters 7 and 12, the Lord had rained down plagues on Egypt. Now, why would he do that? Well, the simple answer is that Egypt was oppressing the children of the promise. But what was Egypt's motivation? And how did the political climate change between Joseph's generation and Moses's? Well, Joseph's family was welcomed by Pharaoh in his day and and the regime that was in power because Joseph's wisdom and leadership brought about God's blessing to the nation of Israel. But history tells us that a revolution occurred in Egypt within the 430 years of Israel's occupation in Egypt. A new ruling family arose, and they saw Israel as a threat and not as a blessing. So Israel's peaceful occupation in Egypt became cruel slavery. Many Israelites, no doubt, saw this dramatic reversal of Egyptian favor as abandonment by the Lord or his failure to provide for and to deliver them. But God was simply creating birth pains, preparing the womb of Egypt to expel the baby nation that was being incubated inside of her for 400 years. And he was preparing also the child Israel to desire to leave the womb. Have you ever experienced the birth pangs of the Lord (laughs) when he has you in transition in life? I have. Perhaps you're in a season like that right now. Remember, it's not up to us to reason what is the Lord doing or how is he going to deliver us. We're simply called to seek his word and to trust and to obey it. We could never fathom the level of deliverance that God has planned for us. And we will all laugh in dismay whenever his deliverance shows up and we'll think, I never saw that coming. You see, the new ruling family in Egypt was more ethnically nationalistic. They identified Israel as being loyal to the past regime and that they were purveyors of a foreign god that was disruptive to Egyptian culture. Hence, God's blessing on Israel was seen as a potential cursing in the eyes of a new pharaoh who saw himself as a god. Consider this from Genesis 13, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 13, verses 1 through 3. So the Lord's word to Abram and the other patriarchs had proven true. Proven true in that Israel had become a great nation. They had been blessed in Egypt. And their name became great. And as long as Egypt blessed Israel, then Egypt would be blessed itself. But it was not enough to be blessed in Egypt. God's promise was that Israel would inherit the land of Canaan. So all of the families of the earth would not be blessed until the fullness of God's promise could be witnessed worldwide. So Israel had to leave Egypt. And on the way out, the Lord would also be true to his word to curse Egypt for cursing the children of the promise. And because it was really the existence of God, uh, the God of the whole earth, who alone exists, uh, and he makes his own promises, and he keeps his own promises. It was really the Lord that Pharaoh was mocking and oppressing by oppressing the people of the Lord. And at the end of Exodus chapter 12, Israel left Egypt. Everything that Pharaoh had feared came to pass but because of his response to the truth of God's word. Pharaoh and his army were overthrown, and at least a million slaves were now gone from Egypt, and the people's personal wealth of Egypt was plundered when they willingly gave away their belongings just to get Israel out and so that the God of Israel would stop sending plagues upon them. 
And this didn't happen because Israel was the threat that Pharaoh perceived. It happened because God was the threat that Pharaoh did not perceive. You see, the same will ultimately come true for anyone who persecutes believers today. Enemies of God, right? We don't expect that you will shudder before the Lord because we warn you of a coming judgment any more than Pharaoh did. But the plagues are coming, and in many ways they're already here. Have you tried to buy bread lately? Have you tried to buy gasoline lately? Have you tried to buy a house lately? Oh, the plagues are already here, and the stronger plagues are coming. You see, they're in the book of the Revelation. The future plagues will act as curses upon the enemies of God and birth pangs for the people of God to make them want to leave this world. You see, in the gospel, everyone is both warned and welcomed. It's your choice. The world is commanded to let you go. And you are commanded to let go of the world on your way out. And with all that being said, let's read from the beginning of Exodus chapter 13. You say, why? Well, there's a narrative which continues into 14. So we begin in Exodus chapter 13, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, is mine. Consecrate to me the firstborn. You see, God not only delivered the firstborn of Israel, the men and the animals, by passing over their sin when His holiness passed through the land. He also purchased them in the process. Didn't just pass over the sin, because, you know, really, what sin does an animal have? He didn't just pass over. He purchased them in the process. They are mine. Now, for what reason did he purchase them? Well, they were to be his priests. The first-hand recipients of his grace and mercy surely would be the greatest priest to tell people about the grace and mercy of God. They were representative of all the tribes, not just one. And surely they'd be the best spokesman. They did not all choose the God who chose them, and so then you have a problem. Just because he passed over their sin, just because they were the firstborn who lived when the firstborn in Egypt got, didn't mean that they all really wanted to be the spokesman of the Lord. And we'll cover the details in that in later chapters. Just keep it in the back of your mind that the Lord purchased the people whom he passed over. Because it is important to understanding the New Testament concepts of choosing and predestination. So later, the Lord will initiate a new priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, based on men's own choosing, a quasi-volunteer priesthood rather than a forced draft of being firstborn. And soon Moses will ask, who is for the Lord? When he comes down from the mountains bearing the tablets of God and he sees that they're worshiping a golden calf, he goes, who's for the Lord? And the Levites will gather to him. God will choose the Levites to be the priests instead of the firstborn because the Levites chose the Lord when the question went out. Numbers chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, consider this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, listen, instead of every firstborn who opens the womb. God's first choice for the priesthood was those who were firstborn, whose sins had been passed over. And then from that point on, if you're the firstborn, now you get to become a priest in Israel. He says, he says, I have chosen for myself the Levites from the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. Why? Because the firstborn, all the firstborn are mine. So on the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified, which means set apart to myself, all of the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. Numbers chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. Now, in the New Testament, an all-volunteer priesthood will be established. 
just was as the case with the Levites. Who's for the Lord? The Levite says, we're for the Lord. He says, prove it. Every man take out your sword and kill these people who were involved in this calf worship. I don't care if it's your neighbor, if it's your best friend, if it's a family member. And so not only did they say we're for the Lord, but they proved it by doing what he said to do. And in the same reasons that the Levites were chosen over the firstborn, because the priesthood must be an individual choice and not a thing that you're simply born into or pressed into against your will. No, we too must be born again into the priesthood of all believers. When we personally choose to surrender to serve the Lord, then he chooses to fill us with his Holy Spirit. And then if you choose to read his word, you'll be taught by the Holy Spirit. And then you will start serving others as a priest, as it were. First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, speaking of New Testament believers, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. For what? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Let's keep reading in Exodus chapter 13, in verse 3. <clears throat> and Moses told the people, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by the strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. And on this day <clears throat> you were going out in the month of Abib. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give to you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no unleavened bread shall be seen among you nor shall leaven be seen among you in any of your quarters. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. <clears throat> tell your son these things about what the Lord did for me. You see, it's not a national salvation. It is a personal salvation. Fathers must personally tell their children what God has personally done for them. And then if you have a nation full of people who recognize this, well, then you have a nation of God. Throughout the generations, the testimony is to be the same for me, not what God did for them back in that day <clears throat> or what God did for us collectively. Every person of every generation needs to personally believe and surrender in order to experience the exodus, as it were, from sin and death and enter into salvation in life. Let's continue reading in Exodus 13, verse 9. It says, It shall be as a sign for you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. A sign on your hand <clears throat> and a sign between your eyes. Consider this in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 9. God said this, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Okay? It's verses 6 through 9. Verse 7, he says, And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets before your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. So what do the hand and the forehead evidence. Well, the hand and the forehead, the hand is symbolic of the things that you do. 
and the forehead is symbolic of the things that you think. So if you're a person who's led by the Lord and you're seeking his word, well, then the things that you think in your head, which are evidence of the things which are in your heart, they'll be evidenced by the things that you do. That's why if you're truly my followers, the things that you do will be evidenced by the things that you think, which is evidence of what's truly in your heart. You know, by the way, the, the forehead and the hand are also the same place where non-believers are marked with the number of the beast, 666. And so <clears throat> there's either believers in life or there are non-believers, only two kinds of people. And what they do is evidence of what they believe. Let's keep reading in Exodus chapter 13, verse 10. It says this, You shall therefore keep this ordinance in this season from year to year. <clears throat> verse 11, And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he has sworn to you and to your fathers, and he gives it to you, that you shall set apart the Lord all that opened the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal, which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem them with a lamb. <clears throat> and if you will not redeem them, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So it shall be when your son asks you in the time to come, saying, What is this that you shall say to him? By the strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Literally, we have been redeemed. And so we are now redeeming those who are born in, in our nation, these, four, these firstborn. Notice he says, when your son asks you, Verse 8 speaks of a father telling his son. And now we see the healthy father-son relationship. The son is asking questions. And the father is both available to the son, and he's also knowledgeable of the word in order to, ask, uh, to answer the question. Let's keep reading from Exodus chapter 13, verse 15. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn. I'm sorry. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sanctify to the Lord all the males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I shall redeem. And it shall be as a sign on your hand and as frontlets between your eyes, for by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt. I sacrifice, I redeem, it shall be a sign. What is he saying? This is a transfer of values from generation to generation. Literally, I do this for you so that you will do this for your kids. This is why it is of utmost importance that people read the Bible that they live according to it, and that they share it, first and foremost, with those who live under their own roofs. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. When it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Verse 18, so God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. God led them by the way of wilderness. There's a lot of people who believe that, you know, God exists in order to always give us this life of luxury. You know, we should name it and then claim it in the name of the Lord and that, that, the, that the blessing of the Lord always looks like earthly prosperity. But God knows the level of your faith. He knows how much faith that you possess. And he also knows not only the level of your faith possession, but he knows your faith potential. And so he's leading Israel by his wisdom in the way that will assure their success and in a way that will draw the enemy close to them, which doesn't seem right to us. We're like, well, hold on, 
hold on, you're going to deliver us by drawing the enemy close to us? Why don't you just keep the enemy from us and we'll be good? The Lord's like, well, that's not the way it has to work because in his wisdom, he knows what's best. And in that way, he draws the enemy closer. So don't focus on the closeness of the enemy in your life. Focus on the ever presence of God. Exodus chapter 13, verse 19. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under a solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. Do you remember the wishes of your relatives 430 years ago? Right? We've talked about this already. In the middle of the night, someone had the presence of mind to go dig up Joseph. <laughs> God kept his word and he honored Joseph's faith. Genesis chapter 50, verse 25. Look at what it says. Then Joseph took up an oath from the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. Now look at what we saw in Joshua chapter 24. This is long after the death of Moses, and this is when Joshua was leading the people into Israel. The Bible says this, The bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem, in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for one hundred pieces of silver, and which had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 says this, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. So what we see is this. Not only did the children of Israel dig up Joseph's bones when they were in the middle of the night, having to flee the country in a moment. But they also carried his bones around for 40 years. And when they entered into the promised land, they buried his bones. Thus, the word of the Lord was made true. So let's keep reading in Exodus chapter 13, verse 20. He says, So they took their journey from Succoth, and they camped at, El, uh, at Etham, at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day as a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night as a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and by night. Verse 22, He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. The pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, you know, the exodus, as I said, happened at night. And Israel set out for a destination they had never visited. Slaves don't get to leave the country when they want. Go on journeys. So they went to a place they'd never been, and they took a path they had never taken, and they did it all at night. So it is the best picture of following God that I can imagine. If a non-believer said, tell me, what is it like to follow the Lord? I said, well, it's like going to a place you've never been, by a way that you've never imagined in the middle of the dark. <laughs> and I'm not just being cynical. Psalm 119, <clears throat> verse 105, says this. It's a familiar passage. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If I could add it, I would say, and a pillar to see even by the day. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7 a verse that we teach children often. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So with all that said, that's a lot of ramp up. Let's jump into Exodus chapter 14. Exodus 14 verse 1 begins in this way. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they um, turn and camp before pi Hahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, opposite baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. I like it. Let's just camp for a moment on this verse. The Lord spoke to Moses. 
You see, this was all the Lord's idea. It was not Moses's mistake that led the children of Israel into an emergency need for a miracle. Just know this. This wasn't Moses's bad leadership. It was the Lord's idea. Exodus 14, verse 2, he says, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pihahiroth between Migdal and the sea. Opposite Baal Ziphon, you shall camp before it by the sea. Verse 3, For Pharaoh will say, The children of Israel, <clears throat> of the children of Israel, that they are bewildered by the land, and the wilderness has closed in on them. Why is God leading us to a place where it looks like we're just close to being completely eliminated as a people, so that Pharaoh will say to himself, using human reasoning and observation to outwit God, God is going to allow Pharaoh in his own pride to draw himself into a trap. Exodus 14, verse 4, he says, Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all of his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. We've already been through this before. God doesn't harden hearts per se, so as to make it impossible for people to believe. God's desire is for all men everywhere to be saved. You know, that was the focus of the Apostle Paul's message at Mars Hill on Acts chapter 17. God does not prescribe what he prohibits in Scripture. So if he commands all men everywhere to believe, well, then he means all men everywhere have the capacity to believe. And, and in this case, what we see is Pharaoh's unbelief. So what did God do that resulted in Pharaoh's hardened heart? Well, the seemingly foolish way that God led Israel caused Pharaoh to doubt even his own decision to let Israel go. No way in the world that any logical God would lead their people to be hemmed in between a mountain that they couldn't climb and the Red Sea. Therefore, I must have got this whole thing wrong. Moses was ascribing to God, things that were just happening by coincidence, let's go kill those Israelites and prove to them that I am the God in Egypt. But God knew that that would happen. Still, God did not make belief impossible for Pharaoh. Pharaoh's pride did all the heavy lifting. Let's keep reading in Exodus chapter 14, verse 5. Now, it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot, and he took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots, and all of the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. Went out with boldness. Hmm. It's amazing how bold that we are until spiritual opposition shows up. You know, they say people are like tea bags. <laughs> you never know what's on the inside until you put them in hot water. And the Red Sea is about to boil. Let's continue reading in Exodus 14, verse 9. So the Egyptians pursued them. And all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and they overtook them, camping by the sea, beside Pihahiroth, before Baal Ziphon. Pharaoh's army overtook them. And the words of American Revolutionary Captain William Prescott, Israel could see the whites of the Egyptians' eyes. Let's keep reading. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 10, sometimes we don't consider how close that Pharaoh really got to them. They overtook them. And were it not for a miracle, there's no way that Israel could have gotten out. Once again, let's keep reading in verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, they go out marching bold. But then they look back. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them, so they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. 
Verse 11, And then they said to Moses, Because there's no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in this wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Interesting. They cried out to the Lord by complaining to Moses. <laughs> Remember when Moses refused the call of the Lord to be God's spokesman? He said, I don't want to do it. Maybe my brother would be a better idea. God told Moses, well, Aaron will be as you to them. He'll be your spokesman. And then you will be as God to him. Well, the problem with convincing people that you're God is that you're not God. And yet the people will seek you for things that only God can do. And then they'll blame you for situations that only God could have the wisdom to bring about and the power to deliver you through. So now let's continue the narrative here in chapter 14, verse 12. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Isn't this what we told you? That we don't want any of this. We are, we're happy being slaves. You know, all of Moses' burning bush anxieties are coming to a boil in this moment. He's like, this is exactly why I didn't want to go out there, because I'm like, my lips don't work. I, when I try to lead people, they just won't follow. And all of those anxieties are coming to a boil here at the edge of the Red Sea. Everything that Moses told the Lord would fall apart because of his faltering lips. It was all happening. The people were rejecting the leadership of Moses. Plus, Pharaoh and his army were pursuing to destroy them all. And this was Moses' great moment of crisis. Let's see how it goes. Exodus 14, verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Almost sounds like a Taylor Swift song. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The Lord will accomplish everything that he said that he would do. Moses rightly shifts the people's attention away from the man of God. They're crying out to Moses, why did you lead us out here? And he shifts the focus away from himself and he, and, he, and he moves it toward, not the man of God, but toward the God who made mankind. Psalm 46, verses 8 through 10. Come and behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars stop to the end of the earth. And he breaks the bow, and he cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Notice Moses says, hold your peace. I love that line. I love that word. I like what it says. Hold your peace. Hold on to your peace. Don't let your peace be ripped out of your hands like a football running back who thinks he's got a touchdown and all of a sudden a defender comes and knocks the ball out from his hands. Hold your peace. Keep your peace. And let your peace keep you. Men of reason will never understand the God of reason-defying miracles. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Think about that in terms of what's going on here at the edge of the Red Sea as the enemy, the army of the Egyptians, has overtaken the people of God. Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. Look at what he says. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Why, why are you crying to me? I already said what I would do. I'll deliver you. Tell the children of Israel to move on. To go forward. You know, before Moses even cried out with his mouth, he was crying out with his heart. 
The Lord says, why are you crying out to me? Before he cried out in response to the people's unbelief and in response to Pharaoh's advancing, God answers Moses' thoughts. God had already told Moses in verses 3 and 4 that Pharaoh would pursue them. I told you this was coming. Why don't you tell the people? No, this is all part of God's plan. Trust in the Lord. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Now in the world you will have tribulation. That's just like saying, oh, Pharaoh will overtake you. But he says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Guys, it's getting gloriously dark out there in the words of Adrian Rogers. And it's getting harder and harder to be a Christian. But don't worry, he's overcome the world. You will have tribulation. It's coming. John chapter 16, verse 33. The Lord also promised opposition to us. So don't be dismayed or faithless at Pharaoh-level opposition. Just as opposition is promised, so victory is also promised. God says, tell the people, move forward. You know, leaders must first believe and then lead with conviction. Exodus chapter 14, verse 16. Lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. Lift up your rod. Remember that rod all the way from back in the burning bush, the one you've been carrying, the one that after you utilized the rod, the miracles were happening? Lift that up. It's not the power of Moses that's going to deliver the people. It's the power of God through obedience with the rod. So what does the rod represent? It represents the ways and the standard or the word of God. Lift up the word of the Lord and you'll see the evidence of my deliverance. You will go through the sea. You know, <laughs> Moses had to be like, what, what, what are you talking about? The two major elements of both judgment and deliverance in the Old Testament are fire and water. God's people, by God's grace and mercy, will pass through the judgment. Not because of their innate holiness, right? You, you were passed, you've had a pass over, and now they're about to do a pass through. You're passed over by the death. Now you're going to pass through a symbol of judgment. It's not because of your innate holiness, but because of your faith in the God's holiness to keep his word. The sea will remain at bay until your full deliverance. Exodus chapter 14, verse 18 then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, over his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know. You know, sometimes it's like, Israel, it's not about you and me right now. It's about me and the Egyptians. And it's not the Egyptians that are pursuing you that are going to learn the greatest lessons. It's the ones that are left home. The deliverance of Israel and the destruction of Pharaoh is not simply a testimony to Israel. God's power is on display for all of Egypt who are left after the destruction of Pharaoh and his army. And this is because God wants all people everywhere to leave their idolatry and worship him. Once again, Paul's message in the second half of Acts chapter 17. Exodus chapter 14 verse 19 continues like this. And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. The angel of God. Whenever you see the angel of God and it's capitalized, it's not just an angel, although angels are magnificent beings, but it's not just an angel. It is a new, an Old Testament term for the Messiah. Now, we'll know him later when he's born as a baby, and we call him Jesus. But the same angel of the Lord wrestled with Jacob, who met, uh, he met with Gideon. Uh, he, he met with Samson's mother, who was in the middle of the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when the king of Babylon said, I, we threw three guys in there, right? I see four guys, and the fourth looks like the son of God. It's the same one, 
Jesus. It's, you have to remember he has existed forever. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you were small among the clans of Judah, yet will come forth from you the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from everlasting, from eternity. So yeah, the Messiah will someday be born as a baby, and then he'll grow up and we'll know him as Jesus, but he has existed from all eternity. He is the angel of the Lord, not an angel. The angel of the Lord is one of his titles. He's the Messiah. And so Jesus is there doing stuff, delivering his people, guiding the people during the Exodus. We see him all over the Old Testament, by the way. The Apostle Paul places the Messiah there at the Exodus when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, speaking of manna, all drank from the same spiritual rock, for they drank from that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was the Messiah, the Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Once again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. What was Paul's point? It's that just because the Messiah pays the penalty for the sin of the world and offers the only way of salvation to all who would turn from their sin and believe, it's only those who believe on Him who receive salvation. That's how you become children of God. John 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, he gave to them the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. John 1, verse 12. Exodus chapter 14, verse 20 continues like this, So it came, the, the, the pillar of cloud, the Messiah himself, represented now as a pillar of cloud. It says, And so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other. And so the one did not come near the other all that night. <laughs> Once again, don't, don't be afraid to trust everyday situations to the God of miracles. This is the complete protection of the Lord. It's a blackout blind on one side, and it's a headlight on the other side. Exodus chapter 14, verses, verse 21. <clears throat> and then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. <clears throat> Not only did the wind which came lift up the sea, but it acted as a blow dryer. It literally took what would be muddy seas, and we've seen this recently when the Mississippi River dried up in the fall of 2022 and everybody's going out there and the first people I know that walked around there on what looked like dry land they sunk to their ankles and had to be rescued because of the mud had not fully dried up but the Lord caused it all to dry up like a big blow dryer the Hebrew word by the way for wind is ruach ruach and ruach is not just the word for wind, it's also the word for spirit. So all three persons of the Trinity are present and active at the Exodus. God the Father is speaking to Moses. Lift up your hand, lift up this rod. God the Son, the Messiah, is acting as this pillar, which is standing as not only guidance for those moving forward, but it, it is also, he's also representing confusion for those who are pursuing enemies, and now you see the Spirit of God come. The Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew, it is the Holy Spirit. The wind blew. Exodus 14, verse 21, So then Moses stood, stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east Ruach all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the sea, into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. Proverbs chapter 4, the word of the Lord is like a wall. Don't turn to the right or the left. 
Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 27. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead, and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet, and let all of your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left, but remove your foot from evil. Proverbs 4 verses 20 through 27. So, hey, Israel, don't turn to your right or your left, because if you do, you're walking straight into the sea. Just walk straight on the path which has been set before you. And that's an exhortation for us as well. Verse 23 of Exodus 14 continues, <clears throat> And the Egyptians pursued, and they went in after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. You see, Israel's faith, faithful belief led them to trust God for deliverance, so they went into the sea. Pharaoh's arrogant disbelief led him to pursue Israel. Therefore, when he went into the sea, it's going to be a trap. Let's keep reading in Exodus chapter 14, verse 24. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, troubled them. Verse 25, he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove with them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, or the, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptian, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. As the Egyptians are fleeing into the sea, what does that mean? Up to the very last Hebrew was delivered. The Egyptians were right on their heels. They were separated only by the pillar of cloud. That means that the Egyptians had made it all the way to the other end of the Red Sea. And they were almost to where the, the Hebrews, the last Hebrew person to step over the threshold of the shore. And when the Egyptians saw the last Hebrew's foot hit the seashore, they knew that there was little time to return to Egypt, for there was no further reason for the sea to be parted by God. All of his people had gone through. You know, they should have at that moment cried out in repentance to the one true God, but they chose to flee from him, to return to Egypt and recoup their losses, maybe come up with a battle plan to cross the sea in boats and kill them all one by one. Well, it never was going to happen, was it? Exodus chapter 14, verse 31. Sorry, uh, verse 29. But the children of Israel, I'm sorry, verse 28. Then the waters returned to cover the chariots, the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall on them to the right hand and on to the left. Verse 30, so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and the Lord saw the Egyptians dead on the sea, I'm sorry, Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Israel saw the great work. At the same time Israel saw the Lord's deliverance and his judgment, Israel was henceforth without excuse. They saw the ultimate outworking of faith and the ultimate outworking of faithlessness upon Egypt. And when it comes, when it comes to faith, we say that seeing is not believing, rather believing is seeing. 
But that does not mean that we will never see. Faith is not fact until it's tested. But when we endure the test to the end, and the Lord completes what He calls us to, faithfully work toward, well, then our faith grows. And we see the same scene in the Revelation chapter 15, where victors of God not only pass through the waters of judgment, but they're literally standing on them. And the waters are actually a sea of glass mingled with fire. And we even hear them singing the same song that we're going to read tomorrow, the song of Moses. Revelation 15, verses 1 through 4. And then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have victory over the beast and over his image and over the mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Revelation 15, verses 1 through 4. You know, the plans of both salvation and the plan of judgment have been made known to us in the Bible. Uh, so which way do you want to take? The choice is yours. You can surrender and humble yourself unto salvation, or you can rebel and fight the Lord unto damnation. Well, I say, as Joshua said so many years later than this moment we read today, choose life that you might live. You know, Salvation is offered to anyone who would humble themselves and receive it. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer now. And if you've never turned to the Lord, you've never surrendered your life to the Lord, well, then you're not in salvation. And yet that salvation is offered liberally to anybody who would turn from their sin and receive it. So I'm going to pray a prayer. And what this prayer is, is basically the gospel. You can acknowledge to the Lord yourself that you believe that He's holy and that he has a standard, and that judgment is coming. You could acknowledge to the Lord that you understand that your sin is worthy of judgment, but that Jesus has died on the cross, and that he has paid the penalty for your sin. You can acknowledge that you believe that Jesus has risen from the grave, and that he is alive today, proof that he has defeated sin, and he has defeated death. And lastly, you can turn from your sin. You can surrender control of your life to the Lord, and you can receive salvation. The Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And wouldn't you love that? Don't we need that in our generation? Let's pray, and you can speak to the Lord yourself. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. And I know that your standard is holiness. And I could never meet that standard. But Lord, I believe that Jesus has died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. I believe that he has risen from the grave and that he is alive today, offering forgiveness of my sin, the promise of heaven when I die, if I would turn from my sin now and receive it. So Lord, I'm turning from my sin now. I surrender control of my life to you. Lord, come into my heart, fill me with your Holy Spirit, and begin to teach me how to live a life of thankfulness that pleases you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So you say, I just prayed that prayer. Well, if the Lord's word is true, and it is, well, then welcome to the forever family of God, if you really meant it. But I'd love to hear from you because you probably have a few questions. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can type right there in the YouTube uh, space, in the comment space. You can type right there and say, hey, listen, I just prayed with you. What do I do next? And I see all of those and I'll reach out to you. Uh, or you can go to our website, right? Groundworksministries.com. Groundworksministries.com. And there's an info section that comes up there that says, I just prayed with Steve. 
and just say, you know, where do I go from here? I'm going to reach out to you. The rest of you guys, I love you, man. Wow. Tomorrow, Exodus chapter 15, the Song of Moses. I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Check us out at groundworksministries.com. <laughs>